International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. There's a reason why those kids in Baltimore, like kids everywhere else, were protesting. Because they're the ones that are being stopped. They're the ones that are being hassled. They're the ones whose cars are being searched, whose bodies are being searched, and they're being thrown up against the car, and who are then developing the resentment. They're talking about how they're getting treated. It's not just how this kid got treated. It's how we all get treated. I'm here with John Burris, who has been involved with a number of police brutality cases. And of course, we've had quite a significant development in Baltimore. Uh, can you talk about the significance of what's happened in Baltimore? Well, what happened in Baltimore is frankly stunning. Uh, and you have a situation where the local prosecutor has indicted six uh, police officers for events that surround the death of a young man, uh, Freddie Gray, where it looks like there's no direct evidence of what any of the officers done. Generally in police cases, an officer has done something that you could see. They've beaten the person physically or they shot the person in, in ways that were unconverted. But here, you don't have any of that. What we have is a young man who was running from the police lawfully, gets stopped, he's dragged to a police van, he comes out uh, 45 minutes later and he's almost dead. Uh, he has a broken neck, uh, broke uh, injured spine, and the question is, how did, could that happen? And so what the prosecutor basically says is, I'm going to prosecute everybody that surrounds that particular event. And from there, we're going to find out who, in fact, did what to whom. We do know this, that a young man is dead who should not be dead. And it's very courageous on her part uh, to file charges like this. There has been countless cases. And I've been involved in a, a number of cases where the police have done such outrageous stuff. They've shot people in the back. Uh, they, they've shot them running away. I've tried to get prosecution of those cases, and local prosecution never could do it. The only case that has really come to mind where that has happened, and that was the Oscar Grant case here uh, in Oakland. And, and there it was a video camera. Uh, but for that video camera, that case probably never would have been prosecuted. And so what's remarkable about this case, there is no video other than the fact that he was stopped and you could see him being dragged. But to prosecute in modern day America without a video camera is, is quite, quite surprising. When I did the Oscar Grant case, the, there was a video camera that clearly showed what the officer did. And even that officer tried to suggest the camera didn't really reflect what he intended to do. Uh, and, and so he was prosecuted, but he wasn't convicted of murder charges, which we frankly should have been. We had the Rodney King case. And there in that case, I'm involved in this case, this man is beaten over 60 times. And, 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 they, and they prosecuted him, but he was found, they were found not guilty. And, and so it's not that easy to get a prosecution. And in that case, there was a video camera. So uh, what she has done is, is quite remarkable uh, and um, quite fr surprising, quite frankly. Um, well, is she going on really thin ground here legally? And is this a questionable tactic on her part? Is that what you're saying? Well, I hope not. Uh, I hope it was not a questionable tactic. Um, the question, uh, some of the charges, if you look at the charges themselves, you kind of wonder whether she can make these charges. She's charged the driver of the van with, uh, with uh, second degree murder, which means he was of, of a deprived mind. And all we know he did was drive the van. Now they have this notion in there where you can have these rocky drives and people get tossed and turned all around uh, in these vans. And so to the extent that he knew that he was injuring this person or he had knowledge that this person was injured and he didn't get medical treatment and he continued to drive. One might argue that's the function of a deprived mind or it might be that just negligent. I think the real thing that she has done is she's basically said, I'm going to look at this case from top to bottom. The top portion of this case is where this young man was walking, he sees a police officer, they make eye contact, he starts to run. Nothing unlawful about that. He then runs, they catch him, they do so, we don't see this on video, but then they find that he has a pocket knife on him, so then they arrest him and they claim uh, that uh, he was acting illegally and then they claim that it was a switchblade. Well, it turns out it wasn't. So what she basically says, you had no probable cause to stop this man in the first place. And everything that happened after that 
you are partly responsible. So all the men, officers who were involved in the initial stop, there's three of them, they all got charged with involuntary manslaughter, which means they, they participated at the very outset and therefore they're responsible for what happened after that. Another couple of people, particularly a female sergeant, she got charged with, man, with manslaughter because she checked the van a couple of times and the man was asking for help and she didn't provide help. And so the, the prosecutor's basically saying, look, you had a duty to provide help for this man. If you'd have provided help to him, he might have survived. But what you did was neglectful. It was negligent. You failed to provide medical care when you have a duty to do so. So what she has done is prosecuted everybody who touched that case along the way. It may be that in the course of that van, somebody got in that van and did something to this young man in a more physical way. But she doesn't know that, and she didn't prosecute that. So there's a lot of open areas to this case. I'm frankly surprised that she had the very serious charges that she had placed on them without having direct evidence of what they did. It would be very difficult, in my view, in a jury that was not composed of mainly black people to get convictions here. But the most important part about it for me, in terms of the precedent, she essentially has said to other local prosecutors, you don't necessarily have to wait. You know, all this notion about waiting for an indefinite period of time to conduct an investigation, a prosecutor can know very quickly what happened in the case. It doesn't take rocket scientists. You can look at this case, see what the evidence is very quickly. Once you get the statements from the police officers, once you get the coroner's report, once you get particular eyewitness of it, you know what kind of case you have. And, and so she was stunning when I say that because when she had this press conference, everyone thought she was just going to say, we got the case, and now we're going to conduct our investigation, and we'll get back to you. She says, I've already done my investigation. And our investigation shows that a crime has been committed. Once she saw when the coroner came back and said, there's a homicide here. Homicide means there's an unlawful taking of a person's death. It doesn't say whether it's murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, nothing. It just means the person died unlawfully at the hands of another. The question is whose hands was it? And she determined that the various people who touched this body along the way were partly responsible. So a very uh, courageous move on her part, I hope that she had the kind of evidence uh, that would allow her to, to uh, uh, make a strong case. Because if not, it creates a false impression, again, for the black African-American communities. We've had countless cases down through the years where the community has high expectations that a person will be charged and ultimately convicted, and it turns out it doesn't happen. Trayvon Martin is a classic, classic example of that. Even though it wasn't a police officer, it was someone who was acting like a police officer. The Sean Bell case in New York several years ago, where they shot this man who was coming from his uh, bachelor party. Uh, cops opened uh, open, uh, on him, killed him, uh, no conviction. We had Amadou Diallo, a case where a young, young uh, 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 immigrant uh, was going to his place. They told him to stop. He tried to get his identification out. They shot and killed him. These officers were all found not guilty. And, and so, and then, as I said earlier, the, uh, the Rodney King case, the officers were found not guilty initially. So I have this feeling, generally, that it's criminal justice system is really not a place where you can always expect justice when it comes to prosecuting police officers. And the reason being is that jurors and everyday people who are on juries are more predisposed toward the police. And they have this view that the police have a very tough job and therefore we should give them the benefit of the doubt. And unfortunately that makes uh, the African Americans, they don't understand that. Well, number one, they're not on juries. And then number two, they think the criminal justice system is, is honorable and true. It just isn't. It's a racially biased system. The system is designed to protect police officers on its face. And so it's difficult to get any real confidence that the criminal justice system will give a, a verdict that supports what African Americans think it ought to be. Well, and of course, in this case, these individuals, these six, are being charged with homicide in this case. Uh, so the jury doesn't even have the leeway of saying, well, it might not be homicide, it might be negligence. It's either No, no, they, they will have that. Do they have that They leeway? will have that because the, there's several components to the homicide. One, there's second degree murder. That basically is operating as a deprived mind. That's involving, involving, involving grossly reckless conduct. Mm -hmm. But then you have involuntary manslaughter, which is really just negligence. You, in fact, you were negligent in the conduct you engaged in, and that resulted in the death of someone. So that, and so you have that. 
So you have the, the manslaughter and the second degree murder, and you also have assault. But uh, my, uh, what I meant with my question is that has to be stated specifically up front in the middle of the trial or halfway through. Can you change the, yeah, of course. the charges with the jury? Yeah, you, at the end of a trial, you have jury instructions. And the jury instructions include the major offense, and then they have lesser included offenses. A lesser included offense of a second degree uh, homicide murder with a deprived mind is involuntary manslaughter. So, because that just means you were negligent. Uh, deprived mind means you are reckless, grossly reckless, negligent involuntary manslaughter, that means you're just negligent. And that could happen. So, uh, and that's more likely to happen unless, unless there's some evidence that comes through that says someone went into that van and hit this kid and, and, and broke his neck in some way. Or it happened when it was on the street. There was three officers who pulled him down. You couldn't really tell when he was brought into the van. It looked like he was injured. But if he was injured then, and there's some testimonies to that effect, those officers will get charged and have their charges upgraded. Right now, those charges are, are low. Uh, the involuntary manslaughter charge, because the assumption is they're the ones that started this whole event. There's a charge called false imprisonment. False imprisonment means that you grabbed this person and you held this person against their will, and, and that's a pro false imprisonment. And so they, the three people who stopped him initially are all charged with false imprisonment. That's an appropriate charge. If it was a federal case, that would be an illegal seizure under the Fourth Amendment, and, and that's a different kind of charge. Now, all these guys, conceivably, could be charged with federal civil criminal violations. And that is that you've engaged in this conduct designed to violate a person's civil rights. Now, the Justice Department doesn't file many charges like that. Uh, they have, as we saw in the Ferguson case. In Ferguson, the, the Justice Department says, no, we don't think there's a civil rights violation here with respect to Darren Wilson shooting Michael Brown. But they did say, we think there's a pattern of discriminatory conduct taking place in the manner in which the policing occurs in that department, which is a very good thing. And so that's one of the benefits, I think, that has come about uh, from the Justice Department um, that over the last seven years, or six years, um, since Holder was the Attorney General. He basically has said, he hasn't filed many cases, individual cases, but he's filed a number of cases of pattern and practice. That is to say, he's gone to a city and he says, it looks like you guys engaging in discriminatory law enforcement. That took place in Cleveland very recently. It took place in Ferguson, as we know took place in New Orleans, took place in, 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 um, in Newark, uh, it took place in uh, Cincinnati at some point, uh, and in, in at least 20 different cities they have gone into. <clears throat> that has had and will have a major impact on the type of policing that will take place in African American communities, uh, certainly for the next 10, 12, 12 years, if they follow what the Justice Department has told them to do. And as an example of what that means is, and in, in, in after the Rodney King case, L.A., uh, because of the Rampart Division, they had a pattern and practice case. And that took 10 years to do, to get finished. In Oakland, we have the Ryder's case, which I've been involved in, and that's taken 12 years to get through. Now talk a little bit about the Ryder case. The Ryder case is, um, is, is a, an important case in the sense that there, at the time, in 2000, there were four and maybe more officers who were, as they say, riding around Oakland, causing a lot of ha havoc. They were, they were stopping people unlawfully. They were planting drugs on people. They were committing perjury. Um, they were testifying against these people illegally. And they were beating people up. No one was killed as part of this process. But maybe a, at least, we know, 120 people went to jail for crimes that they did not commit. The more outstanding cases where they would take a young person and beat them up and try to get them to tell about other people. They were really trying to increase their numbers to demonstrate that they are arresting people. So we represented me and my co-counsel, 120 people in, ca in that case. And we were able to get a significant judgment for them. But the most important part that's more consistent with, with L, uh, the pattern in practice, we were able to get a judgment that basically it's called an NSA, National Negotiated Settlement Agreement, which is, which is cons consistent with a consent decree, meaning the city has to engage in, uh, in this police department in a series of reforms. And what that meant is we tackled the department from top to bottom, looked at every leverage point where there was a weakness, and made them reevaluate re and rewrite their policies. Then they had to determine uh, that the policies have been implemented, people have been trained on it. 
Now, they had 55 tasks that they were supposed to do. We had a federal monitor and a federal judge. That monitor every three months would come in to audit to see whether or not the department is in compliance with the agreement. Well, it turns out they would have not been. It's been a real challenge uh, to get this done, and we've been at it for almost 12, 13 years now. But, but, but what's going to come out of this, and what has come out of this so far, is that we've tackled the issue of racial profiling. We're now starting to see how to identify what racial profiling is and be able to develop some policies around that. We hired a woman uh, from Stanford, uh, Jennifer uh, um, Everhart, uh, uh, and, and she has been trying to help identify what officers are doing. We've also been able to get the data to demonstrate that racial profiling does exist in the city of Oakland, and so now we're in a position to tackle that. We've also been in a position to look at the early uh, warning systems that are in place. And since we, and we got cameras, of course, we've had cameras for six months. And, and during this process, the shootings are down significantly in Oakland. The beating cases are down. The complaints are down. All of which suggests that the process that we put in place is starting to work. It's been a slow process. We've been fortunate we've got a new mayor who is very much committed to doing this. But likewise, when able to do, looking at some other issues in Oakland, we had a, a notorious case. Uh, one that's very dear to my heart, and that is that OPD uh, men, officers were going around making young men pull their pants down. Just pull their pants down, searching their private parts, kind of giggling about it, uh, claiming that they were trying to find drugs. Well, I represented 45 people in that connection. We got that policy declared to be unconstitutional. You cannot do it. If you think that a person has drugs, first you have to stop them lawfully. Then you have to have another probable cause to believe they have drugs. If they do have, you then have to take them to a private place, whether it's to a hospital or to the jail somewhere. You cannot search them on the street. Because what would happen, they would see right here, if they said that you have drugs on you or not, drop your pants now. And then they would search your private part. And it was kind of a modern day minstrel series as far as I'm concerned. So it was one of these cases that I really worked hard to get done. We had, they had a, another situation where they were, in fact, uh, had illegal search warrants being issued for people. Uh, it turns out there's 100 people that we represented that they had search warrants in their houses uh, based upon informants that was false. And so we got that policy um, uh, put aside. So uh, it, it, we've been able to do a lot me, in private practice. Me and, and this other lawyer have looked at a lot of these cases. And of course, now I have a bunch of shooting cases. <laughs> I, you know, I tried to get uh, a case uh, recently, everyone knows about the case in South Carolina where the man was running and he got shot three times in the back. I have a case in Oakland, I had a case in Oakland where a kid named Jody Woodfox was running from the police. He got shot three times in the back. There's no camera. And, so the, and I tried to get the officers prosecuted. Could not do it. Uh, he got fired, then they restated his, they gave him his job back. That man had shot not only shot Jody Woodfox three times in the back, but he shot another Indian boy six months before, and nothing was done about it. Uh, and so I tried to get prosecution. I, I represented a, a young Mexican uh, up in uh, uh, Manteca. He got shot maybe 15 times by the police. They claimed that he had a knife. He didn't have a knife. I couldn't get the DA to prosecute. So I've had a number of cases where the out shootings in, of, of uh, unarmed men uh, where I couldn't get prosecution. We had a young man uh, last fall who was running from the police. A deputy sheriff shot this man in the back of his head, killing him. He was unarmed. I couldn't get the DA to prosecute. And so, it, what has happened here in what has happened here in um, in, 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 in uh, Baltimore is remarkable, because there are countless cases around the country where shooting of unarmed men is commonplace, and nobody gets prosecuted. Well, and that begs the question then, do you think her action in this case will become a, um, a role model for prosecutors around the country or will there be a backlash and a hardening of attitudes? That's a very, very good question. I, I don't see it as, it as a harbinger of things to come. It's too early to say that. Number one, Baltimore City is sort of an isolated area. It's essentially a black town. All the officials are black. Most of the police officers are black. The mayor, the district attorney, the police, the police, the police chief. That's a little bit different than going to Contra Costa County or Solano County, where the prosecutors are not, uh, and, the, and, the, and the area is not black. 
In Baltimore, the police union really spoke out strongly well, against what she said. Well, that is something that whether a politician has enough guts to find, uh, find off the police unions. Police unions are very powerful in every city. Every we city. saw what happened in New York City. Every city, whether it's Oakland, San Francisco, they always rally around the officers. There's never a situation where they don't think it's improper, at least publicly. And as a consequence, they are always at loggerheads with the mayor or any public officials who they think uh, are taking a position that somehow is attacking the police. The police have a notion that they have to be viewed in the most public, positive light at all times. And even if they have dirty cops, they will try to cover them up. They might do something with it internally, but for us to know, that's not something they want. So there will always be, I don't view it as a backlash, I view it as just, that's stonewalling. And there will always be stonewalling no matter what. Because the unions themselves are only about one thing, protecting this officer. They're not designed and looking for the truth of anything. They're only looking to protect this officer. And they not only did that there, they do it everywhere. New York, uh, Ferguson, Oakland, uh, Baltimore, this is not unique. You know, it's just not unique. The police union, that's going to be their response no matter what. And yet, given the work you've done for the past 12 years, and you referred earlier to Rodney King and uh, looking to Baltimore, there seems to be some, uh, and, and Eric Holder and the work he's done at the federal level, uh, I hear from you some sense of progress and forward movement and reason for optimism. I, I do have that. I'm basically an optimistic person by, by nature. Uh, I have to be. And because I also think this. Social progress is very slow. It just doesn't happen overnight. You have to, move, you have, to have events and people in control will react to those events because they don't want their city to be that city. You know? And so what happens is they will go back to their departments and talk to their officers and try to figure out how to make sure that doesn't happen in their towns. I've had a lot of successes in places I don't even know because lawyers will say, Burris, man, you, got, you've had, you have more positive benefits here and, uh, and, uh, and in your work than you realize because everybody knows that when you sue them that there must be something there and then they will try to make sure it doesn't happen again. That doesn't mean they like me. That, that's, that's clearly not the case. But, Lawyers like myself are all around the country. There's not a lot of us, but in every area, there's three, four, maybe Arab police officers, police people, and some more in other areas who are, who are doing this kind of work. And they are having progress in it. And, and now it's even better with the public attention. And it's going to even get better given the, the advent of video cameras where everybody can take a photo of what's going on. And by doing that, that means there's a possibility that everything a police officer does can be seen. And then what we saw in Oakland is because of the advent of cameras, we have less police brutality cases, we have less complaints, because even the citizens, you know, <coughs> citizens do bad stuff too, you know. <laughs> you know, and they act out, they challenge the police, they say stuff to the police, police have to sometimes grin and bear it. And, and so with cameras, if they know they're being uh, video, they, they don't act out as badly. And so it, it has a way of calming situations down. And so I'm very happy about the advent of cameras. I think more cameras, the better. It's not the end of be all, because I'll tell you this, no matter what that camera shows, the police officer say it doesn't mean what it, it, it isn't what it, you see. And so it's your, your eyes are lying to you. But at the same time, it also helps in terms of the evaluation of what's going on. Let's go back to the local situation. You talked about the progress you've made working through the legal system over the past 12 years and, uh, and an administration in Oakland that seems to be supportive of real reform. And yet we continue to have um, protests in the city, in some cases, as last night, which turned violent with the destruction of property. Yeah, I would say that the vast majority of people protest peacefully. They want to protest. It's kind of a First Amendment right. The mayor and all public officials around Oakland that I know of are in sync uh, and in solidarity with some of the issues that are taking place nationally as well as locally. However, there are a group of protesters that are anarchists and they will seize every opportunity to break windows, to destroy property, to loot. And, you, and I see that in every place, whether it's Oakland, um, in uh, Ferguson, Baltimore, New York, wherever, they, they will do that. Surprisingly, surprisingly, not so much in San Francisco. 
And so the question, how do you deal with that? And that's a real challenge. I mean, I've been in meetings where we've had real discussions around crowd control, because I worked on the crowd control policy for a number of different protests that have taken place. It was part of one or more of my lawsuits. And so efforts have been made. But none of that will work as long as there's this element that comes into the city and seeks to destroy it. And the mayor can't stop it. We can't stop it. It's there. And so that presents a really uncomfortable aspect. Now, I don't know that you can totally control it. You obviously have law enforcement personnel around. We certainly don't want to get to the place where we've got to cop every other place and you, and you create this, this sort of standoff uh, where the cops themselves are placed in a position where they could be targets and then, then they react and then they start throwing stuff into the crowd and somebody gets hurt, uh, which would inv invariably happen. So I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I'm disturbed by it as much as anyone else. Um, but it is a fact of life that we do have people who are hell-bent on destroying uh, the city of Oakland. Do you have any idea of who we're talking about here? Are these people who live within the city? They're not Oakland people. These are not Oakland people. These are uh, whites, for the most part, who come from out of the area. Uh, I don't see a lot of young blacks doing that. Um, uh, they don't generally come to the protest marches in the first place. Uh, they're, they're coming now, but, but the protests around police stuff is really a mixed group. A really mixed group, and I haven't found them necessarily being in a destructive mood. But there's always a group that's lagging behind, and those groups I have found are not from Oakland. These are people who are white young people from other places, but not Oakland, because we don't have that many white young people in Oakland who are involved in any of the protest marches. The move that we do have gentrification taking place in Oakland, and those are young people moving into downtown areas and some of the new apartment buildings, but they're not. They're not protesting. They're just moving in and enjoying their lives. But with these anarchists, we'll call <coughs> them, and maybe they're not even anarchists, maybe they're just people who see this as a free-for-all who want to come in and have fun. Or have you uh, been able to see any reports that outline who some of these people are? No, I have not. Uh, I haven't involved myself in that aspect of things. Uh, I just, when I've been out there, I see these, young, these people with these masks on. And I see them doing stuff. And so I'm sort of risk adverse to these kind of things. So I try to stay away from it. But I know that they're there. The issue for me is does it distract from the greater issue, that we're, the societal issue that we're trying to deal with? And that is the issue of police misconduct and it's in the police relationship with the community. Those are bad deals, no question about it. But the overall aspect of which we're dealing with, from my point of view, is how do you improve the police community relationship? How do you cut down on police brutality cases? How do you cut down on uh, death cases? How do you improve the relationships so that young people and the young people can feel that they can live in the city, that they can walk around they, and without being hassled? They're not being stopped. They're not being um, uh, wrongfully stopped, wrongfully have their car searched, and wrongfully uh, taken to jail because they, weren't, they were defiant in some way. Pretty much what, what happened to this young man, uh, Freddie Gray, uh, it can happen to any young man here in Oakland at any point in time. You may not get killed, but you can be stopped wrongfully, chased. They don't like your attitude, you can be taken to jail. And you get into the criminal justice system and your whole life will change. Because once you get in, it's hard to get out. And if you're poor, you would undoubtedly, because of the, um, the, the, the uh, judicial system, plead guilty to something just to get out. And when you do that, your life will be forever changed. Well, I'd like to think, thanks to your efforts, that's happening a little less frequently in Oakland. It is happening less frequently in Oakland because one of my major issues when I started this case, I want to see every case where there's a what called resisting arrest without an underlying offense. So I want to know who's doing this, who's stopping people and the person hadn't committed another crime and then they wind up getting charged with a crime. That's one of the major areas I've been able to stop. Well, Oakland has become a model for the nation, thanks in large part to your efforts. And mm -hmm. let me also thank you for taking the time to talk with us right now. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burris. Thank you. I've enjoyed it.